Here uh, we have tonight's book talk by Dominic Ryle. And to introduce her, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Michael Miller. Okay, thank you, thank you Hugh. Uh, my colleague and friend, Dominique Ryle, began her career as a student of modern Italian history, working with Victoria de Grazia at Columbia University and interested in the rise of nationalism in the first half of the 19th century that it, for Italy would culminate in what's known as the Risorgimento or the unification of Italy by a little bit after the second, uh, a little bit after the half of that century. But rather than focusing on the usual cast of characters like Mazzini and Garibaldi and Cavour, she turned her attention to a group of intellectuals and writers and journalists, all nationalists, at the head of the Adriatic Sea, some in Vienna, excuse me, some in Venice, some in Trieste, uh, some a few, few other places, all of whom were committed to the idea of nationalism in certain ways, but wanted to really carve out a multinational region in their part of the Adriatic because they were a mixed population of both Italians and Southern Slavs. And to do this, she discovered she had to do a certain number of things. One, she had to add Serbo-Croatian to her already rather oppressive, ar impressive array of European languages, which she knew. And secondly, she discovered that besides being a historian of Italy, she had become a historian of the Habsburg Empire. And thirdly, she realized that she was gonna be writing therefore imperial history as well as national history. And that the two often moves on so, sort of parallel tracks and could be complementary as well as dichotomous. And the outcome of that research and that work was her first book, Nationalists Who Feared the Nation State, Adriatic Multinationalism and Habsburg Dalmatia, Trieste and Vienna, which was awarded- Venice, to Venice. And okay, well, whatever. <laughs> awarded the 2014 Center for the Aust Austrian Studies Book Prize. Um, and those uh, rather all encompassing and against the grain characteristics which she brought to that first study, she carried over to her next book project, which was going to push forward into the 20th century and look at the city of Fiume at the head of the northeastern. Uh, corner of the Adriatic, again, a place of mixed populations, Italians and Southern, Southern Slavs. Um, Fiume, it was not something that historians knew nothing about, rather quite the opposite. It's been quite well studied and it's often been seen, particularly uh, in those moments right after the First World War, which was the focus of this, the second book, the years immediately afterwards, uh, as a kind of a pivotal moment in the migration of 19th century nationalism into 20th century fascism with the sort of illicit, shall we say, not the sort of, but the real illicit seizure of power temporarily by Gabriel D'Annunzio and his um, paramilitary legionnaires who followed him and uh, became something of a model for Mussolini as well. Uh, Ryle, however, saw a very different story in Fiume. Um, story she saw was uh, what happens when an empire implodes and comes to an end? Uh, what does it mean for the people left behind? Uh, particularly for a city which had prospered so well uh, and for a multinational population within that city which had prospered uh, in that time under this empire. Uh, that the end of empire was not simply about geopolitical rewritings of geography or the creation or disappearance of uh, new or older states, but it was also about what happened to ordinary people in their day-to-day -day lives, trying to deal with a completely new world where previous ideas of what was legal or illegal no longer necessarily mattered or counted in the same way. Uh, what uh, currency of the past was no longer necessarily valid in the present. Uh, what it meant to be a citizen no longer necessarily held any longer as well. Uh, this is really a sort of st study of what happens when the very basic structures of your life, which have been set up by the empire, disappear along with the empire itself. And the result of this, this work uh, was a really stunningly revisionist new book, 
uh, try and get the title right, the domain for you this time. It's sitting right there next to me. The Fiume Crisis, Life in the, in the Wake of the Habsburg Empire, which is already one uh, honorable mention from the Association for Slavic, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies uh, for the Barbara Jelovich Book Prize. Uh, and it's uh, steadily revisionist because it made us, or when you read it, makes us rethink everything we thought we knew about this subject on Fiume, and particularly in two ways. What was this crisis all about? What was the real story here? And secondly, um, how do we understand empires? Uh, does our current way of using, thinking about the concept of empire really adequate to cope with a very different imperial world that had disappeared and that produced a great deal of nostalgia and longing for what was missed when that empire was no longer around. Uh, however, uh, this is a uh, subject which Dominique can tell you far better about than I can. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to her for her book talk. The chair is Dominique. Oh, thank you. And Michael obviously is the person that I sent stuff to. And when I sent him a copy of the book, he read it almost immediately. And I wasn't surprised because this is someone who, from the first day I started at UM, always made me feel like work is about dialogue, conversation, reading each other, talking together. And there's nothing more appropriate than doing this, a book talk with colleagues and students, uh, the community together, talking about, this is why I always look so tired for the last 10 years. Let me share <laughs> the gift of my exhaustion. Um, Michael made it feel vibrant and he couldn't have, actually in some ways, he's already said a lot of what I plan to do. So I'm gonna do a share screen because there's no way we can do a Zoom without a PowerPoint. Um, I get sick of my own voice. And I am going to do two things, three things in this. I'm gonna set it up about what Michael said. This is a story that isn't an unknown story. It's actually a very famous story, but it's a very famous story for a certain kind of person, someone who teaches on fascism, someone who teaches on interwar Europe. They know, they know, they think they know this story, but I'm assuming most of the people here don't do that. So I'm gonna set that up and I'm gonna give you a little roadmap of what the book is. And then I'm gonna give you a little slice of what the book feels like. Um, this is a book that was written for, with the assumption that no one knows anything about this and trying to make it feel alive and real. And that's what I'm going to try and do for us today. So the, the title of the book is uh, The Fiume Crisis, Life in the Wake of the Habsburg Empire. Actually, it should be flipped. The real book is Life in the Wake of the Habsburg Empire using the Fiume crisis as a entryway, a vehicle to get into the story, to understand the stakes of, of thinking about dissolution and regime change, getting, as Michael said, left standing with the state gone, and with one of the most famous moments of nationalist activism after the war. So, taking the one of the most famous stories after world war one of nationalism is the new engine of community energy organization activism movement and showing hey maybe it wasn't another way you could call this book is how europe tried to stay the same by changing everything and if you've read a lot of novels <laughs> you probably know what that's about but one way or the other i'm going to take you through the story that we do know about Fiume, and then I'm gonna show you why I undid it. So Fiume, I am assuming no one here knows anything about this place except for my close friends who have heard me whine about it. So what is Fiume? Why is this famous? It's probably not famous for what it was, which was a city. It, Fiume in Italian means river. Today, the, the city is called Rieka in Croatian, which also means river. This is the river. It is not a very impressive river. It is a river that has no importance whatsoever, except for the fact that it cuts a line in, in geography. It is a non-navigatable river, which in every language means little river. The reason why you would name a town river that made its entire fortune off of this thing, the sea, is because it was never really an important town except for administration. 
It was an important town because it was used as a border between administrative uh, states. In Roman times, it was used as a, as a, a line between provinces. In, in medieval times, it was used as a line between dioceses or bishoprics. And in the 19th century and 20th century, it was used in terms of, of laws, taxes, and, and, and administrative units. Fiume is this thing here. This river divided it from this thing here. If you think in terms of, America, of American geographies of New York City and Manhattan and Brooklyn, all together, this is Rijeka today, the third largest city in Croatia, but its parts, so this is like New York City, its parts are Manhattan, Fiume, and Sushak, Brooklyn. And actually this kind of metaphor I'm using about New York City was used during the Paris Peace Conferences after World War I, was used in world geographies to try and explain why this city was so important. They literally talked about it in terms of trying to explain to the reader, trying to explain to the diplomats, this is like my Manhattan, Brooklyn. It's an interdependent unit of separate administrative spaces. I wrote this book around when this place became a hotspot. Before World War, the end of World War I, it was a hotspot because it made money. It was like a Hong Kong on the Adriatic. It was a separate administrative unit for global finance, for shipping, for, for loading emigrants, people leaving Europe to go to New York City. They left from here. 30,000 people a year left from this town of 50,000 people to go to New York City and arrive in Staten Island. When the war was over, the Habsburg Empire, which had controlled this town, was gone. And so it's like, what if you could just get Manhattan? It became an enormous diplomatic headache of who is going to get the town. To the, to the, if you can see this little map here, to the west of the town were territories newly occupied by the Kingdom of Italy. To the east of the town were territories newly part of this kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, what would one day be Yugoslavia. Both of these surrounding kingdoms wanted the jewel, wanted the Hong Kong, wanted the Manhattan for themselves the population of the town was also very diverse, filled with Italian speakers, Croatian speakers, Hungarian speakers. And so at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 in, uh, with Woodrow Wilson and Lloyd George and Clemenceau trying to make a new map of Europe with the Ottoman Empire gone, with the Habsburg Empire gone, with the Russian Empire gone, with the uh, Hohenzollern German Empire gone, this was one of the things people were really fighting about. And they were fighting about it because, again, it was a money town, it was a boom town. It was about a lot of wealth and opportunities that were now up for grabs. Now, no one probably knows it for the town itself. As I just said, they know it for this. They know it for front page news in 1919. They know it because it was the trigger of the only walkout at the Paris Peace Conference among the big four, around the, among the victors. So it's April, 1919. All the, the head of the United States, the head of Great Britain, the head of France and the head of Italy, the, 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 the winners of World War I, Russia had made a separate peace. They are trying to make a uh, peace treaties for Germany, for all the ex Habsburg lands. They're trying to remake the world as quickly as possible so the revolution doesn't take over. And Woodrow Wilson, the, the American president, is very convinced that the way to make sure this war was not just a booty war, it wasn't just about who can get the most territories and who can get the most money, was about this thing many of you have probably heard of, self-determination. That this, this war, though it might have begun because of imperial appetites, should not end because of imperial appetites. And he decided based on you know, expert opinion he was getting 
and a certain aversion to it, the kingdom of Italy, that Italy should not get fuming. And the Italian diplomats were in a pickle because they had pretty much been promising their, their constituency that they were gonna get fuming. This town before World War I was never promised to the Italians. It was not on anyone's radar. They didn't go to war to get fuming. But because of media and all these things, in 1919, when Wilson told the Italian diplomats point blank, you're not gonna get it as long as I'm alive. And that actually is true. He did <laughs> die before they got it. Um, it. They left, they walked out two weeks before Germany was supposed to sign the peace conference. So if you read any book about uh, the Paris peace conference after World War I and the remaking of the maps of Europe and the Middle East and uh, the African colonies and some of the Asian colonies, you, there will be a large segment around this town, Fiume, which is kind of staggering. This is a little place, but it, it, it held so much importance because of geopolitics. So this is why you might have heard of it. The more likely reason, and this is what Michael uh, uh, mentioned, uh, is about this guy, Gabriele D'Annunzio, who I'm sure many of you have never heard of. I, I saw Logan is here, he probably knows too much about him, but deep down, uh, this is a poet, <laughs> a poet who wrote plays as well and novels. He was, you know, kind of old by 1919, he was almost 60. Um, he, he was, he loved to get into trouble, he loved to be scandalous. Uh, he was the most famous living Italian in 1919. So that means a lot of Italians knew who he was, but people all over the world knew who he was because he was part of this culture at the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th, of being outrageous. He's kind of like an Oscar Wilde uh, of, of doing and saying every, everything you really know you shouldn't, but you have so much fun doing, and he wasn't gay. He also, he wasn't rich, and he, but he loved the pretenses of wealth. So he's constantly getting into trouble. He got kicked out of three states because of bankruptcy. He was famous before World War I began, but then when World War I began, his fame went from the salons and the newspaper readers and the people who love scandal sheets to even the ends of the illiterate, the working classes, because he decided that World War I was the best thing to ever happen. This man who was in his 50s decided to volunteer for the Italian army, he totally didn't have to, and he became the kind of poster child of war. He was so famous, he started writing columns for all the newspapers, giving speeches in every town. People loved him because all the news was so depressing about World War I, especially the Italian campaign, which was one disaster after another, that he was telling everyone how great it was. And people were getting really sick of the depressing news and all the corruption and all the death, that having him giving grandiose speeches of how wonderful this war was and how important the sacrifice was kind of got an audience. He also was an aviator and he, you know, he flew over Vienna and dropped pamphlets gang, go, saying to the Austrians, give up, these could be bombs. He, he got on a uniform for the Navy and he's like, I wanna go attack something. Let's go attack something, this is getting boring. So they attacked something, but it happened to be an Italian boat, but who cares? It was exciting, he wrote about it. He was in the trenches and he would give speech after speech while flirting with maids, um, saying, this is the most important day of your life. This means something. In the middle of a war that most people couldn't understand why they were in it. So he, was, he became, from, from the hero of the, the middle and upper classes, he became this figure for every class that wanted to believe that their sacrifice meant something. Why does he have anything to do with this Fiume story? And if you see this, like, look at this. These are the stamps of the town. They, they are his bald head. He, it, books about Fiume are, are pictures of this guy. When you hear the word Fiume, most people, except for people who live in the town today, think Fiume equals denuncio. And the reason they do that is because on September 12th, 1919, 
he got into a red convertible. I am not making this up. There it is. If this was a colored picture, it would be red. And he drove with about two or 300 people walking behind him. And, you know, we'll never know the right numbers. So please just don't pay attention to the numbers. Pay attention to the story because this is where, why this is all famous. He, he went from Italy, from outside of Venice, and illegally crossed the territories to get to Fiume. It was about a six hour march, it was not fun, maybe even more. He gets to the town. The town had been occupied by American, British, French, um, and Italian soldiers in order to make sure no one occupied it, in order to make sure that Woodrow Wilson and all the diplomats in Paris would decide who gets Fiume, in order to make sure no one could conquer the town. So they sent representatives of all of the big powers to make sure no one took the town. D'Annunzio gets there and he goes, I'm gonna take over the town. And they say, no, you can't be here. And he literally gets out of his car, shows them his chest, with all his war medals and says, what are you gonna do, shoot me? And, and he's thinking about Napoleon. He's thinking about the hundred days and people trying to stop him. If you don't know that story, it's a great story. It's a great story that he knew was a great story and they can't, they just don't shoot him. And people have tried to understand why they didn't shoot him. And the answer is they were afraid if they shot him, the soldiers standing behind would shoot the commander who ordered the, sh the shot because he was so popular. So he walks past these, so these armies and enters the town to quote unquote, liberate it, to church bells ringing, women kissing him, flowers being thrown in his honor. This is in September, 1919, about almost a year after the war has ended, at almost a year of arguing in different peace treaties and diplomatic halls about where this town should go. The reason why he went there, he'd only been there once before for less than two days, he didn't like it, he thought it was a boring place. The only reason he went there was because he wanted to annex it to Italy on his own. He wanted to show that the stuffed shirts in Paris, that the politicians in Rome, that all of these political people who seem so corrupt and out of touch and cynical were not Italy and they weren't power. Power was the men who fought. Italy was the, the emotion, the feeling, the nationalism, the wanting to be great again. So he gets there and he thinks in a couple weeks, he's going to force the hand of the diplomats in Paris, force the hand of the Italians to recognize his annexation of the town to Italy. Totally wrong. He fails. <laughs> 15 months later, trying desperately to keep his thing alive, the Italian state attacks the town and forces D'Annunzio out and forces the town to admit it can't be part of Italy. Italy attacks the town to make itself admit it's not part of Italy. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is all true, isn't that weird? So th this is a crazy story and crazy stories are always fun to tell, but it's a story that's told so often because it's seen as meaning something bigger than just a crazy story. It's supposed to be about the origins of Italian fascism in many ways, the origins of fascism in and of itself. And why that is, is not just because some bald guy from a balcony gave huge charismatic speeches about nationalism and empire and we're the greatest, AKA D'Annunzio is like Mussolini. It's actually told more about these guys, these followers, the legionnaires. These are the two or 300 guys that followed D'Annunzio in his convertible and walked their way to Fiume. These are the people, many of them current soldiers or veterans or misfits of some kind who thought that this is exciting stuff, that this is worth sacrificing your life for. They are going against the state. Many of these people are risking their pensions to do this, risking their jobs 
to go to a town that they had maybe not heard of. And they, they think they're the nation, not the state. So this idea of, of why do these men follow him? And where are these ideas coming from that are so engaging that they change history is, is what people think is the key of understanding how World War I paramilitary men and charismatic leaders got Europe off the tracks of parliaments and democracies and elections and on the tracks for authoritarian dictators, black shirt squads, and what we know is going to happen, genocide and, and war, total war. It ends in right around Christmas, New Year's, 1920, 1921, with, as I mentioned, this, this war, this bombing of the town by the Italian state. D'Annunzio, in his typical poetic genius, calls it the Christmas of blood. And now after World War I, there's been a lot of bloodshed. You know, blood is, especially Christmas time, Jesus, you know, it, it, it's a very, very dramatic way of thinking. And it's about the state against the nation, right? That's how it's getting sold. Less than 50 people died. This was not very bloody. But it, be, it just covers the newspapers because it just is an unbelievable story of a state attacking a town to force it to say politics is more important than nationalism. Geopolitics, the decisions made in Paris are what the state is gonna be, not the emotions of nation. I think that you can see why this is a story that people need or use or, or explain so much. Why is Italy fascist so soon? When we think about Hitler, when we think about Germany, when we think about the authoritarian states in Eastern Europe, even when we think about how the Western European states start, start losing, losing many of their democratic impulses, we, they're always about 10 years later than the Italian case. Why is it so early in Italy? Why is it 1922? when Mussolini has his march on Rome. And, and almost every history, whether it is an Italian history or even, and this is the most amazing thing, Yugoslav historians. So usually people of Eastern Europe, the Balkans, who tell histories about this time period and this era, think of Italian history as racist, as xenophobic, as explaining away the politics of ethnic cleansing that happened along the Adriatic. As, as Michael mentioned in my, the introduction, this, this place between Venice and Budapest along the sea was mi a mixed land of, of people of many languages. And yet the Italian politics and most of the histories about Italy around the sea tell it as Italian and somehow erase, just as the fascists later would physically erase, the territories of the Slavic others. So strangely enough, Italian history thinks of Fiume as the story of fascism, and Yugoslav historians go, totally, we completely agree with you. So both sides that have focused so much energy on this area agree that D'Annunzio is the beginning of what is going to happen in the interwar and during World War II. Any book about Italian fascism has in its index in uh, D'Annunzio and Fiume. It is, it is a foundational story. It is not just a foundational story for dorky historians who love to find you know, the unexpected. It's a foundational story because Mussolini actually made it the foundation story. He, he created an entire pension for every single person who could prove that they had followed D'Annunzio to Fiume as the shock troops of the nation and the proto-fascists. Many of those people who followed D'Annunzio then later joined fascism. And so the story makes a lot of sense. So both in the time period of the 1920s and 30s, this story was, was seen as foundational for the making of the fascist revolution. But then later, and still today, 
this history is considered an origin story of charismatic fascism. Global historians, this new trend in history, have taken this story up too. You know, global historians, what does global mean? It means not just doing New York, Washington, DC, London, Paris, Berlin. It means also doing other places. And Fiume has entered this story. And the two most famous are this book that came out with uh, by Robert Gerwald, very, very famous German historian, with a wonderful title, The Vanquished, Why the First World War Failed to End, which he has an entire chapter dedicated to Fiume, showing that this is where we can see how the energy of the soldier, the paramilitary, refuses to be identified with the state, that something happened during the war that, that created a disconnect between the soldier of the nation and the soldier of the state. And Pankaj Mishka, who's a very, very famous and very, very smart author, mostly about post-colonialism and racism, has written this book called Age of Anger, in which the entire introduction of the book is about Fiume. And it's saying that we can see what D'Annunzio is doing is the birth of anger politics and charismatic leaders. That if you want to understand, he says this, this is not me, this is him. If you want to understand Donald Trump, if you want to understand Boris Johnson, if you want to understand ISIS, you need to look to Fiume. So this story of a town of 50,000 people that none of us have ever heard of, I had to learn it too, has taken on a significance in the historiography and the histories of how did fascism happen after World War I that is pretty extraordinary. As Michael said, this, this has been written about a lot. I find this all very scary. I mean, I find fascism scary, and I guess that's why I find this scary, because most of the histories about this are actually not about violence. And I think about fascism as violence. Most of these are, and the most famous book about this is called the, 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 the Revolution Party, are about how the 15 months that D'Annunzio was in Fiume, waiting for something to happen, were kind of like a big party. In order to keep his followers there, and they were a mishmash of people. Some of them were anarchists, some of them were libertarians, some of them were monarchists, some of them were socialists, some of them actually could care less about politics. <laughs> he did a bread and circus kind of thing where it was a lot of parties. There was a lot of cocaine. There was a lot of sex. There were the futurists came in. Uh, yeah, Toscanini came in. Marconi, the inventor of the, 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 the telegraph stuff, he came in. And it became this kind of who's who, like a Met Gala of who's going to be in Fiume this week. And, and D'Annunzio did it on purpose in order to keep Fiume in the news because nothing was happening, kind of got boring. So it just started getting weirder and weirder and weirder. Pirates <laughs> taking over ships. I mean, it just starts getting weird. But the whole point of the story was, don't worry, this isn't scary. This is revolutionary. So when I think about fascism, I think scary, not party. And the fact that the historians keep on seeing it as a party is doubly troubling because they're taking the media manipulation of D'Annunzio, his rhetoric, his turn of the phrase, his Christmas of blood, and, and using it as the story. Somehow we got, I mean, this man was a genius at media. When he was 17 years old, he pretended to have died to, to get more of his copies of his first book of poetry sold. He spent his entire life manipulating the media. And yet, historians, some, some analyze his media savvy, but when it comes to Fiume, it's somehow, because of this interest in the Legionnaires, is treated as the history of why this thing happened. So my question that I started, that I think the book is trying to answer, is if there's so much paramilitary revolution, why is there so little violence? Usually, you, when you think of a bunch of ex-soldiers or people with guns in a civilian town, trying to take it over, this is not a kumbaya story. So how did this happen? That it's, uh, it's Woodstock with guns, but no one's getting shot. The answer that's given is charisma. 
So here's D'Annunzio giving a speech. This is not in Fiume, this is in Geneva. But this thing of the swarm trying to listen to him talk is seen as that's why there's no violence because he created consensus. He almost brainwashed followers through the use of his words and through the manipulation of gender norms, religion, uh, the grand phrase, masculinity, imperial dreams, what have you, but that the reason why there's so little violence is that the charisma created that much consensus. That might be all fine and good for the two or 300, and many more came later, but left soon, followers, the legionnaires. I think that actually is probably pretty true. But for the town itself, that does not make a lot of sense. Over half the town did not identify itself as mother tongue Italian. They identified themselves as Hungarian or Croatian, as Michael said, Slovenian, Croatian, German, what have you. It was a port town in a multinational empire. It was a multilingual place where the two official languages were Hungarian and Italian. It was a town that fought in World War I against Italy, not for Italy. It was a town that had been bombed by Italian aviators. It was a town in which widows and people mourning their family members, the people that killed them were most likely represented by D'Annunzio and his followers. The speeches that D'Annunzio was giving on his balcony every afternoon, and he did give speeches every afternoon, were about Habsburg scum. It was about Croatians who are little more than monsters, monkeys, apes. The idea that him quoting Dante, him quoting Garibaldi, him talking about Italy's right to expansion, him talking about Croatians who are subhuman, him talking about Habsburgs as inherently evil and they deserve to die, it's very hard to imagine how that kind of charisma is winning over this town. So if it's not the charisma, what is it? Because honestly, it is consent. Something is going on to make the town throw wreaths at the sky, ring church bells at the sky. When he says, don't shoot, sure, maybe the Italian soldiers don't wanna shoot him, but when he gets into the center square, nobody shoots him there either. So why not? If we think it's because of his followers that they somehow are having some kind of peacekeeping influence, look at these guys. This is like a Vanity Fair shoot for thugs. These are soldiers who have gone through the war, who have come to Fiume because they believe they deserve their booty. This, this engagement between these guys and the civilian population could have easily turned into the nightmares we do know happened in the Baltics, in Ukraine, in Macedonia, in many parts of the Balkans, and honestly, in many parts of what is today Germany and, and Bohemia and Poland. So, so if it's not D'Annunzio, who's the guy who's brainwashing everyone into consensus, and it's not his followers who are being some kind of UN peacekeeping force, what is it? That is the question of the book. The answer I got, and it's not, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I went into the archives to re-people the history, right? I was like, this is all about Italy. Why is this town's history all about D'Annunzio and his followers? Where's the town? So I went into the archives looking for the town, trying to put in the Hungarians and the Croatians and the Germans and the Slovenes. And as I kept on going, what I started finding was what a sociologist would find, what I, if any of you know, Charles Tilly would tell me to have looked for, which are the pillars of the state. So what I found was even though the Habsburg Empire, which was the empire Fiume was in, had dissolved in late October, early November 1918, the day-to-day -day life of this place continued to function more or less as if the state was still around. A ghost state was in function. Not everybody's like some phantom zombie just going along as if nothing had happened, but using uh, the structures they had, shifting them, changing them, corrupting them. But 
desperately trying to just go on without too much problems, with just avoiding revolution. This is the same time as the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, the same time as the revolution in Hungary, the same time as the revolution in Munich, the same time as the social Democrats in Vienna, the same time as the socialists in Italy. What we see going on in this town, if you look, is all of these efforts to keep a town filled with dock workers, filled with factory workers to not revolt. And, and, and using systems that will keep people satiated enough to just keep going. So the, the book is divided into a short introduction and a short conclusion, most of which I just did. A first chapter, which is also a lot of what I just did. But that's just to get you into why using Fiume is kind of exciting to tell the story about post Habsburg lands. The real book is chapters two through five. The real book is about looking at, like what Michael said, how, what, what does life look like when, when the state is gone? And I did it by looking at different angles of how to get into that story. So what do you do when your money doesn't, that if, if, if the United States disappeared and you have your dollar and you live in the state of Florida, do you have a Florida dollar now? How does this work if you don't have a federal government anymore? And the, the law, okay, I live in Florida. The, I, we do have state laws, but we also have federal laws. What, what, what do we do now? Do we make up new laws? Do we follow the old laws? Do we, would, do, we do something in the middle? What is our citizenship? Does our, does our driver's license now our passport? So any resident is a citizen? What is gonna happen? What does social security mean? In, in Habsburg terms, that's what's happening on the ground. And finally, where am I? Am I in North America if I'm in Florida or am I in the Caribbean or am I in, and seeing how on a day-to-day -day basis for the three years I studied, from the lowest to the highest within this, the local communities of the town, you see all this activity trying to solve these problems to best fit their interests. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. The, the weird part about it is, however, even non-Italians want annexation to the Italian government. They want to take their position, and there's, there's, there are people who don't, but the majority, even non-Italians want to take their prior position of being like the Hong Kong of the Adriatic of the Habsburg Empire and transfer it to being the Hong Kong of the Adriatic for the Italian Empire. Not being part necessarily of the Italian nation state, but of the Italian Empire. So what we see is them, these people from the highest to the lowest, kind of trying to create, consolidate themselves before getting put into Italy, right? So being kind of an autonomous unit in a future in, in a future Italian empire. Enough of this, that could be an article. The book is a book and the book is written weird. The book is written with lots of little stories of people you've never heard of. And it's written in a way that's supposed to shock you into thinking about pragmatism. So I'm gonna give you just a little slice of what the book feels like. I'm going to take a little slice from chapter three, which is on law, which in my Dominique way of thinking was rebel law, sovereignty through layering. And in the fancy Harvard way was legal ins and outs, crafting local sovereignty. And the, the, the example I'm going to use is about food. So at the end of the war, everyone celebrating the war is going to end. The day after, everyone's like, oh my God, I'm starving. <laughs> you see the two front pages. <laughs> the 11th of November, war is over, everything's great. The 12th of November, oh my God, everyone's starving. The reason why they're hungry is all the reasons that some of us know from the COVID pandemic is because of destruction, uh, the destruction during the war of lands and farms, uh, the, the lack of people to work lands, to, to make uh, food, to you know, harvest, to take care of animals. Um, and people have the Spanish uh, flu. So we have a lot of sick people going on simultaneously. Plus the number one priority of all these states that were at war was to feed their soldiers. So we also have 
kind of a disruption in no, normal patterns of food management. These are all true for the Fiume story too, but the other, the big reason why Fiume has a food problem is it was an urban center, remember it's right here. It's an urban center that had made all of its fortune and had boomed 60% population increase in the 20 years before World War I because of railway lines, steamship lines, roads. It was a transportation hub to link trade. So before World War I, you were never as full, had a full body, as full a body of belly as you did in Fiume. After World War I, there are new borders. The trains aren't running because no one knows who's in charge of the trains. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, a total uh, blockage of the, the Adriatic Sea. So there's not allowed to be any ships going anywhere because everyone's waiting to know who is in charge of these lands. So what happens in Fiume, which is true for many urban centers, is it gets kind of bubbled up. So a place where food was in, in ready abundance became a place where food was scarce. You would think that's a problem, and it is a problem, but this man, Ivan Rosic, who no one has ever heard of, except if you read my book, thought of it as an amazing opportunity. He's a hoarder. So on October 23rd, he had made a contract. He was an innkeeper, 56 years old, from outside of the town, about 15 kilometers outside the town. And he had made a contract on October 23rd to sell four wagons of sauerkraut, of cabbage, to uh, Ivan Slavko, also someone you've never heard of. <laughs> and on the evening of October 23rd, the Habsburg Empire in this region dissolved. The policemen went away, the state just disappeared. And so on the morning of October 24th, 1918, Ivan Slavko sent to, uh, uh, Ivan Vosic sent to Slavko Ivancic uh, for the, the money in return saying, I'm really sorry, I can't give you your sauerkraut because they won't let me bring food into Fiume because the borders are closed. So sorry, here's your money. You'd think this would be over, right? The world is falling apart, the state is gone. No one knows what's gonna happen. You would think this is the end of the story. Of course, you can't get the sauerkraut. But Slavko Ivacic uh, was, was, had already sold. He would even buy four wagons of sauerkraut for his own you know, digestion. He bought that and he's already sold it to other merchants in the town. And he lives in this town. Remember, it's not that big a town, but 50,000 people. And he's in the know. And he's like, this is baloney that you couldn't have sent it to me. You just want a better price. This is baloney. So he goes on November 1st to, the, to his lawyer and him go to the courts and he sues Ivan Rosic for, uh, for, for damages because he lost all this money because he then had to renege on all of his contracts. November 1st is a fascinating date to go to court. On November 1st, 1918, three different councils in Fiume claimed sovereignty. The Italian National Council claimed that Fiume was a natural part of Italy and said, we are Italian now. The Serb Croat uh, Slovene Camps Council in the town said, we are now part of the kingdom of Serb Croats and Slovenes. We're not part of Italy. And the Socialist Council said, we're not part of any nation state. We're part of a socialist revolution. On November 1st, while these political histories are happening, these two cabbage guys are going to the courts. Our histories are all about the councils. These guys are all about the cabbage. And it keeps on going. This court case goes from, from November 1918 until March 1920. What happens between these time periods? We have the inter-allied troops that come, those Americans and French and Italians uh, and, and British. We have Danunzio coming uh, on his convertible and they all leave. And now we're, we're, in a, we're in a state trying to annex itself to Italy. Then we are in a siege mentality. Then we have Danunzio who's giving one speech after another about how all creations are terrible and this is Italy and blah, blah, blah. Listen to these names, Ivan Rosic and Slavko Ivancic. These are not the most Italian names you've ever heard. And yet they keep on going to the courts. 
they go and go and go. And these keep on going because Ivan Rosic then countersues Slavko Ivancic for, for a frivolous lawsuit. So now they're, they're, not, they're not just having one lawsuit, they're having another lawsuit. Why does this keep on going? It keeps on going, first of all, because a lawyers like to make money and let's just do it, but also because the laws have not changed. The Hungarian laws about, about contracts and frivolous lawsuits are all still getting used, even though the state is gone and everyone is claiming it in different systems. The other reason it doesn't go away is the courts keep on functioning and they keep on doing their jobs. They do their jobs so much that finally, when, um, when Slavko Ivancic wins his case against, against the very sneaky hoarder, Ivan Rosic, they do it because they had gone to the Croatian town where the guy was supposed to send the, the sauerkraut from and took testimony from all of the railway workers in Croatian, this is in Croatian, went to the town, came back to Fiume, translated it and used it as trial evidence. This is at the same time as the most nationalist of national stories. Remember the bald guy, the convertible, the Italians, the paramilitary, Italy, Italy, Italy. We have two Croatians fighting through the courts using testimony from other Croatian places all while this is all going on. What's even more crazy about this story is the courts keep on changing in appearance. So first they use the same name that they did before, the Royal Courts of Fiume, Royal meaning Hungarian Habsburg. Then they're called just the Courts of Fiume, not Royal because the Habsburg Empire, but they just cross it out on the piece of paper. See how they just keep on crossing it out and adding new things. Now it's in name of the king, that first thing was the king, AKA like Franz Josef, the Habsburg king. Here, then they just cross that out. And in order to make it clear, Vittoria Emanuele III, the, the Italian king. So on the surface, if you were looking at law, it's Italian. But what's happening is it's not Italian. It's the same. It's just calling itself Italian. The Fumians are deciding what they want to keep from the system they had before, what they want to change now that no one's in charge of them and calling it whatever they want as Italian. The story is a story that is just one of hundreds throughout the book that are looking at, let's not just look at what it looks like on the surface. Let's see what it, what's really going on here. And, and, and why does it keep, why does life keep on going on? It's not easier, it, this is a mess. No one's having a great time, but there, this is not, D'Annunzio once called Fiume the Holocaust city. In his mind, Holocaust was a good thing. He thought Holocaust was the burning of nationhood that will get rid of corruption. I know, I know. The Holocaust hadn't happened. But that's not what's going on on the ground. What's going on, on the ground is like really pretty amazing pragmatism about, you know, maybe we're not even surprised by hearing this. So if you follow the, the incredible stories of the convertible guy and the black shirt guys and the nudists and the cocaine, this seems like a break in history. One that you can completely connect to Mussolini, to imperialism, to ethnic cleansing. But if you look at it in terms of the people on the ground in the town who have not been brainwashed by charisma, but are dealing with the realities of day to day, what you start seeing when you follow the cabbage, when you follow the sauerkraut is, is other choices. And you also start seeing it's not all Italians. It's a bunch of Slavs too. People who, if, if you can read Italian, these are all um, test documents in the uh, Fiume archives that are saying that Slavs, Croatian, Slovenian, Serbs, should no longer be allowed to have business licenses, should no longer be allowed to be lawyers, should no longer be allowed to be judges. These were definitely um, political uh, uh, initiatives that were begun, but they were not enforced, or at least they were mostly not enforced. To the point that for, from November, 1918 until March, 1930, you got two Croatian businessmen fighting and using the Croatian courts in order to win their lawsuits. So I'm ending here. What, what I basically did in the book was to try and say, watch the cabbage. Watch what day-to-day -day life is looking like and why 
people still are surviving. That under, uh, 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 under the umbrella of political nationalism, a nation is all over the place in this history. This is not a national or national indifference. This is, I mean, I, I, if I were them, I would have a headache hearing the word Italian and nation as much as they, they were. But under it, something else is going on. Something about trying to rebuild the world they had the way they wanted. Not the way Vienna wanted it or Budapest wanted it, but the way Fiume wanted it. This is a story about a very small place, but I think it's kind of a way to tell a story about all these places, because in all of these histories, you can find it. It's just not the story told, because we've been trying to understand why fascism, why ethnic cleansing, why violence, but we haven't been paying that much attention to why so little compared to how much it could have been. That is where I'm gonna end. I hope I haven't gone too long and I hope you guys aren't exhausted. Um, I'd love some questions. Thanks, Dominique. Um, we're pretty much at nine, uh, but I'm sure some of you will want to stay on. So we will stay on for a while. Those who wish, those who don't can quietly slip away. Um, Dominique, would you like uh, me to curate the questions or would you like to handle them? And oh, you, you can go for it, but I love that uh, Eduardo and Ashley have put a copy of the book in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's probably best if people put the questions in the chat. Um, oh, I mean, I'd love to hear voices if you don't Oh, okay. Want to. Well, it's so in that case, I'll just step aside. Um, yeah, I'll take over. Hey, George, let's hear it. You're on mute. Sorry. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. It's an important story. Um, Thank you. I guess my question is, and, and is that, you know, I am very fascinated in general by what takes place in Eastern Europe in the aftermath of World War I. I think actually in the United States, it's, it's a story that's very much undertold um, about really in many ways how the war did continue after World War I in the East with, again, amazing ethnic cleansing, communities that had lived together for centuries, uh, now we're basically attacking one another. Uh, and so, I mean, I do find this story interesting, of course, because that's not what happened there. Uh, but it, it certainly did happen with an amazing amount of ferocity uh, throughout, throughout Eastern Europe, again, in the aftermath of, of World War I. So I don't know if you wanna maybe I guess my question would be to give us some perspective on this compared to what else was going on in the region. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. And it's one that you always have to answer. So yes, there was no, that very little violence there, but there was a lot of violence other places. So why was there violence in the other places? And I think that if this was a mathematical formula, you could flip it. There's a lot of violence in the other places because there's a lot less administrative structure that is continuing. So if you look at the histories of Ukraine, which is one of the hot spot bloodlands, or you look at parts of Poland, or you look at Macedonia, what you see is that there is not enough of continuity of those structures to control the violence. And why that is, is and this is, this is just true, Fiume was a place that during the war was where hospitals were, it's where trade lines were, it's where uh, requisitions were made for the troops. It was not on the battlefront. And so if you look at Vienna, there's not a lot of violence in Vienna either. So when you look at the places where there's the most violence, most of those places were where the violence had happened. So if you look at the Baltics, where, I mean, some of the scariest story of rape and fire, that's where people were fighting before. So if you wanna take uh, what the Fiume story is, is what if we don't only tell the histories of, of the nightmares and we tell the histories of the other stories too? And this isn't a great dream story either. It's just not the same level of violence. I think that there's a tendency for Eastern European history to almost focus with glee on everything that is violent, exotically violent. There is just as much violence, if not, you know, in many of the Western front areas, as we know, unfortunately. And yet with Eastern Europe, we rarely talk about the economy and laws and, and civic culture. And we talk about 
the rapes and the fires. And so I guess in many ways, this is a correction to money was a big problem in Eastern Europe too, if not more. It wasn't all nationalism. It was also nationalism, but it wasn't all nationalism. I don't know if that helped. Well, I mean, I'll just quickly add, yeah. you know, quickly add, you know, you're comparing it to the American experience. And again, this is just, I'm not, I, I, again, this is just thinking about this. And again, I found this, that I found this history post-World War One that you're covering here. I found this very fascinating mm -hmm. because in the American case, right, what you have is much more assimilation, much more adoption of a common language. Whereas in Eastern Europe, you have these communities persist mm -hmm. and these identities persist over time. Mm -hmm. And then you have these outbreaks of violence mm -hmm. that occur when all of a sudden everything becomes zero sum. Mm -hmm. so well, I think with the American case, it might be more interesting to compare it to times of war. So it might've been more interesting to look at the American Revolution or the American Civil War and what happens in, in these areas than looking at after World War I in the US because there is no war in American territory and so what is going on in transitions between you know, what people think politics are is not, is not, is not about waking up one day and not having a government. Um, but I, if anyone else has any questions, just because I know we have to hang up really quickly. And George, we can always talk. No, I understand. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anybody else? I think Adelina has her hand oh. up. Oh, excellent. I love Adelina's question. Hi, Professor. Congratulations. Um, I feel like you already know um, what I'm going to ask, um, <laughs> but uh, I know that your final chapter of your book is about education. Um, so now seeing it all together and the way you speak about your argument, it made me wonder, um, especially because of your final uh, point when you said why so little compared to what it could have been how do you how do you think that changes in education um at that time especially in the city like Fiume that like you said was uh, the Hong Kong of the Adriatic and it was a, a multilingual and a multinational um kind of like city how do you think the changes in education in the language in the curriculum in um in the schools how much control did people have over that to make it what what they wanted to make it at that particular moment. So what's really interesting about what goes on in the schools is that the, the teachers are not new, right? So they are the same teachers as before, except now they don't have any central government telling them what to do. And so they get to decide how much they're going to change and how much they're not going to change. And what they decide to do is make sure they're never going to get replaced. So if they just took like an Italian curriculum and and superset it onto the Fiume curriculum, well, wouldn't that mean that someone who was raised in Florence would get their job because their Italian's better? Wouldn't that mean that someone who went to university in Rome would have a higher chance of being the principal of the school because they can quote Dante better? Because these people got their licenses and their education and went to their teacher training colleges in the Habsburg empire. So they learned how to, how to cite some Dante, but some other stuff that no Italian ever needed to think. Another example is foreign language requirements. In Italy, you could not get a teacher's license unless you could pass a French course. In, in the Habsburg Empire, that is not true. You have to pass German. So it, even just in terms of keeping their jobs, they start changing the curri curriculum and making it Italian, but not the way an Italian would. And in some ways, securing the centrality of their own world in, in how, not just what their job is going to be, but, but what generations will need from who can educate them. Only Fumians, actually. I don't know if that made sense. Um, yes, and it's it. fascinating. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Anyone else? No, it's late. I understand. I'll just wait a, a, a few seconds more. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, Brenna yeah. has a question, and then maybe we'll make uh, Brenna's question up. Uh, Brenna and oh, no, those the last two questions. Yeah. So, um, Brenna. How are you? Thanks for a wonderful talk. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm wondering whether you think that this sort of pragmatism is like a specific product, um, a sort of pragmatism that's aligned with a kind of like um, non-attachment to the the kind of name or ideology of the people who are in charge. Um, is that 
does that specifically come out of the experience of being like a prosperous piece of an empire that you're not the center of? Um, or do you think that that kind of pragmatism is uh, something, a more widespread phenomenon? Yeah, I think I, I, I'm, I'm working on this new book on LaGuardia and I'm trying to like uh, put this argument forward that the, these, 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 these economic hubs of the Habsburg Empire are not old towns, even though some of them might be old, they're really bustling capitalist towns that are changing very fast in a way that we would think of as almost American. And that this town is, is the prime subject there in which again, 60% of the people who live there had just moved there in the last 20 years. So anyone who's really into being a national, whatever their nation is, why would they move to that town? I mean, if you're really into being Croatian, go to Zagreb. If you're really into being Italian, go to Rome. If you're really into being Hungarian, go to Budapest. People are going there, going for jobs, going for money, going for opportunities, or maybe they miss the sea. But it's not the place you would go if, you're, if you really are into being the heart of the nation. It's also not a place that has a heavy level of feudalism and traditional power structures, right? These are, these are again, Hong Kong of the Adriatic. This is new money, new families. So maybe there's something about this that, that that is similar to other of these capitalist melting pot immigration towns in Europe that makes them perhaps a little bit more pragmatic. I never really trust the myths of the traditional or whatever. I don't know if Milan is any less pragmatic a city than, than, than Fiume is or Trieste yeah. or lots of other places, but there is something in here that maybe there's a predilection towards pragmatism precisely because most people who live there aren't from there, maybe like Miami. Chuck? Good, after, good evening, doctor. <laughs> uh, wonderful talk, thoroughly enjoyed it. Did you, in your travels through that part of the world, look at how important uh, Fiume was versus uh, other cities that had traditionally been important in trading hubs such as Trieste and Venice, which are very close by uh, given the, uh, the, the, the naval, the, the nautical access and, and obviously uh, good land, increasingly good land access. Yeah. I, so my first book was about Trieste in Venice, and I've worked there quite a bit. And my next book is going to be a lot about Trieste. And one of the things that Trieste was also part of the Habsburg Empire, for those of you who don't know, it was in the Austrian half, while Fiume was in the Hungarian half. And a lot of people ask, why is Fiume the one that's the hotspot city and not Trieste? Because after World War II, it's Trieste that's the hotspot city. So the reason is, is that the Italian military had already arrived in the town and already taken it over even before the Paris peace negotiations start. And Wilson had already said before the first meeting that he's fine with Italy taking Trieste. So whether it's in diplomatic terms of what's going to happen at the peace treaty, it was already understood that Trieste was going to go to Italy. Also, the, the Italian military was already in Trieste. So there wasn't an inter-allied thing like what was going on in Fiume. So a lot of people say that Trieste is actually the origin city of fascism. That there's something about the first year after the war where you have a military administration of, of Italians who are trying to de-ostracize the town that actually emulates much more what's going on with early fascism than what Fiume is. So in, in doing my history, Trieste is always there, right? And, and the reason why Fiume becomes such a big town is the Hungarians build it up in, in competition with Trieste. So it's a town whose entire history has been always you know, compared to Trieste. So it, it, it is, um, it's a different story though, because there isn't the same kind of autonomy that the town has. No one in Trieste can make everything up from new the way that these Fumians can. So it's a little different, but there is a lot of similarities in terms of regime change and traditions and laws. There, it takes a while to change everything. But thank you for that question.
And I think we'll uh, uh, end there. Um, one advantage of the uh, regular mode as opposed to uh, the webinar mode is that we can do reactions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> applause or you can clap wildly like that. Um, well, I'm going to clap to you guys for giving up your Wednesday night. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you for enjoying, uh, um, uh, for, for giving us a wonderful talk, a very enjoyable talk. And uh, hope everybody will come back to our next book talk by Nabil Hussein and uh, that uh, you'll uh, come to our other events. So thanks. And uh, I guess one last thanks to Dominique. Aww. I will see you guys all sooner than we all want to probably, but I like seeing you tonight. Bye. And thanks Eduardo for reminding me what my book looked like. <laughs>